Hi, I'm Johnny from UltimatePaperMache.com. Just a couple of days ago, I started this little sculpture of Winnie the Pooh. Probably the biggest reason that I started with this guy is that he's really little, he's really simple. It would go together, I thought, really fast. And it would be a perfect way to test out a new tool that I just bought to help me create armatures for sculptures out of crumpled paper and masking tape. For the last couple of years, I have not used uh, crumpled paper and masking tape for my sculptures. I've been using crumpled foil and hot glue instead, just because it was getting too hard for me to get the masking tape off the rolls, especially just the cheaper kind of masking tape. This, this kind of masking tape is actually pretty easy to get off, but the regular masking tape is a whole lot less expensive. It, it was just getting too hard for me. And then I found out through a cooking channel, actually, that they do make a dispenser for masking tape. You see, it's just really easy, and, and you can't believe how much faster it was for me. So if you want to make sculptures out of crumpled paper and masking tape, like I, I used it for all of the sculptures in my book, Make Animal Sculptures with Paper Mache Clay, you can make beautiful sculptures making armatures that way. But it makes it so much easier if you have that dispenser. So I'll, I'll put a link to that down below in case you're interested. Now, let's go ahead and, and get started on this fellow. It took me a lot longer than I expected it to, just because I kept changing my mind. I kept thinking, oh, this would be better if I did it this way. And so it, it took me a couple of days instead of the few hours that I thought it was going to take. But it won't take you very long. If you go ahead and watch this video all the way to the end, you can see what I changed and, and do it your way first. Maybe plan it out a little better than I did. So let's go ahead and get started. From Winnie the Pooh's point of view, I'm sure the most important part of this sculpture is the honey jar. And so I found an old cardboard roll that used to have some paper on it and I got a a saw out and cut it up into a small section just to use for the jar. You don't want to use a nice saw for this sort of thing because cardboard can dull a blade really fast. I put the roll on top of a piece of light cardboard and drew around it so that I can make a bottom for the jar and cut it out and then just use some masking tape to tape all the way around the edges. I put a little bit of newspaper right around the center of the jar just to make it have kind of a rounded belly, I guess you call it. Could have left it just straight, but I decided it would look more like an old-fashioned honey jar if it was more round. Then I started crumpling up some newspaper and using the masking tape to kind of hold everything together. Uh, the first part that you want to do is the... Uh, the belly and chest area. He's kind of a pear-shaped bear <laughs> and you definitely don't need any kind of pattern for this. He's really simple and so just go ahead and, and crumple the paper until you get it, um, the size and the shape you want. I decided that I needed a little bit more paper so I just stuck some more on the top and then started wrapping it up with the masking tape. Once I had the body pretty much shaped out the way I wanted it to and the bottom of it was flat enough so it would you know, sit where it belonged, it was time to make a head for him. And again, it's just really simple. I just crumpled up a ball. He has a kind of a pointy bit on the front for his muzzle. And I just kept uh, adding more paper as needed until I got something that looked like one of the illustrations in the original book. I did tape the head on, but it's, it's going to change quite a bit before the whole sculpture is finished because once I had the jar and the arms and legs and everything attached, I just found another position that I thought would be more fun. But taking the tape off and, and moving it around isn't all that hard, so uh, that's okay. I made two ears out of crumpled foil and I could have done this just as easy, actually probably easier just by cutting half circles with some light cardboard. I actually moved those ears around a lot. It was kind of hard to decide where the center line was on that head just because I had sculpted it so casually. There wasn't a real obvious <laughs> place to put those ears. So I, I did move them around. I think one of them got moved three times, <laughs> but in the end it turned out okay. And then I started crumpling up some paper for the, f the feet and the legs. I didn't yet know if I wanted to put the uh, honey jar between the legs or if I wanted them to be up on top of his knees or you know exactly where I wanted it to go. So I just went ahead and 
made some leg-like <laughs> things <laughs> out of the crumpled paper and just kind of played around with it. If you're making a really big sculpture and it's kind of serious and you really want it to come out in a particular way, you probably want to plan it out a whole lot <laughs> better than I did with this guy. But this one is just for fun. I'm going to be giving it to a little girl that's one of the newest members in our family. She's only about two years old right now. She's not going to be <laughs> a real art critic. So, so I figured I had a little bit of wiggle room and I could just go ahead and play with it while I was making it and move things around as I went along. The arms and legs have to fit around that honey jar, but I can't really uh, attach the honey jar to the bear right now because they have to be painted separately. There's no way I could get a brush around at the back of the jar or even on his tummy and parts of the unpainted parts would show. So I do have to kind of guess where everything's going to go. I want him kind of looking like he's reaching into the honey jar to get his honey out and that's one of the reasons I'm going to be moving that head. But I do like the position of that arm. I really had intended to keep Winnie the Pooh on that heavy round wooden plaque, but I decided it was too big, so I found some smaller oval ones, and they're really skinny. I can't remember why I bought those, but they were so skinny I had to stack three of them together to make it look <laughs> it all substantial and I'm still not actually sure that I made the right decision on that one. You can let me know what you think about that. I used some masking tape to put him in the right position on top of the plaque. I put him kind of a little bit cattywampus because I have a little idea that I want to try later for the for the base. Um, I, I, what I would not do in the future is actually tape and paper mache the bear to the plaque. It made it so much harder to paint and I just don't think it looks quite right because well you'll see it's just it wasn't right. I mean it's it's okay <laughs> but it would have been so much better if I had not uh, actually attached the plaque and the bear together but you do have to make sure that the bear's bottom is flat enough so that you can actually glue it to the plaque after everything is painted. And then I just started adding paper strips and paste. I got the paper out of some boxes. I've been having to buy some stuff online for my kitchen project so I had a whole bunch of it. It's just newspaper that hasn't got any printing on it and so that's what I'm using. And I'm also using some cooked flour and water paste. I'll put a link to that down below. I'm not going to make you watch me <laughs> do all the paper mache because I do have a whole video on how to do that in case you haven't done paper mache for a while. Uh, you can go ahead and watch that video and see how it's done. Before I put the paper mache on the head, I got the jar back in place and I moved the head around. I wanted him to be kind of looking inside of the jar. That meant I had to kind of cut the head off and put a little bit of foil back there on his neck to, to keep it in place. And I also did move those ears around a couple of times. I finally realized that it was hard for me to find the center line on the bear's head because there was kind of accidentally a an eyebrow on one of the eyes, his left eye, and there wasn't one over on the right side and so I just didn't know where the middle between the eyes was. So I added just a tiny little bit of paper to that area and gave him another eyebrow and then I was able to figure out where those ears went. Winnie the Pooh is wearing a blue shirt that's way too small for him on the cover of the classic edition of Winnie the Pooh. And I just thought it was really cute. I couldn't find an illustration where he was eating honey and wearing the shirt. But I decided to go ahead and give him a shirt anyway. And I just used some paper towels and wrinkled them up. If you want your bear to wear a blue shirt, make sure that you pull the plies of the paper towel apart. Most paper towels have two plies. Just pull them apart first and then go ahead and put them on your sculpture. Just as soon as the paper mache was dry, I decided that it wasn't quite as smooth as I wanted it to be right on the bear. And we quite often use drywall joint compound, just a really, really thin layer of it to smooth off paper mache. Works really well. But I did something really silly. <laughs> and I would never do it again. It was totally pointless and took a lot of extra time. But um, because I had just done an experiment to see if we could make colored paper mache clay with powdered pigments, I decided just 
just to see what would happen. <laughs> I decided to put some of the powdered pigment in the drywall joint compound. And I used the burnt umber because that's what color Pooh Bear is. It made brown drywall joint compound, but then you have to smooth it off with the rag and, and so parts of it, uh, you know, parts of the actual paper mache th show through it. It doesn't, it, it was just silly. But you can make a do-it-yourself gesso. Uh, it's not acrylic, of course, but you can use drywall joint compound and glue plus the pigments, and that would make a colored gesso that you can paint on. But I was using DAP drywall joint compound, and you can't mix Elmer's glue all with it. It, it, it just turns it into rubber. The only kind of glue that will work with DAP that we found so far is Gorilla Wood glue and I didn't have any. So this this was just a silly experiment and I covered it all up with my acrylic gesso later. When the gesso was dry I mixed up some burnt umber acrylic paint with some water, made a really thin mixture and painted that over the bear. I didn't really like the uh, brush marks very much on the bear, so I used my stencil brush to just kind of dapple it in there and get the brush marks off. It turned out okay, but the one thing that you have to be really careful of if you're using a, a wash like this over a large area and you're only thinning the paint with water, you can end up with a bit of a line if you brush new paint over the old paint that has already slightly dried. I did that in a couple of places. I actually uh, got one of those lines right down the middle of his head and I had to cover it up with gesso and start over. So if I did this again, I would definitely use the golden glazing liquid instead of water. One of the purposes of the glazing liquid is that it makes the paint dry a lot slower and you don't end up with those, those weird lines where the old and new paint meet. I did use some golden glazing liquid when I painted this shirt. I used it with ultramarine blue and white. And in that case, I probably could have gotten away with just using water instead. But after uh, fighting with it, uh, with just the water on the burnt ember on the bear, I decided to go ahead and use the, the glazing liquid. The reason that I'm thinning the paint with either water or with the glazing liquid is that I wanted to have kind of the, the watercolor effect that you see in E.H. Shepard's original illustrations in the classic edition of the book. I used a fine tip pen permanent marker and added eyes, just a tiniest little dot. And I actually, I, I did cheat and um, place them with a pencil first because I wanted to make sure I was getting them in the right place. I had a little bottle of folk art paint that was called Fresh Cut Grass, which was perfect for the base. I went ahead and painted that. And then, I, I forgot to tell you before, I had actually made um, little rocks that sit right next to Pooh Bear. And those are... I, I just wanted something to add just a little bit more interest to the base and give him something to sit next to so it looked like he had an environment. So I stole uh, just a couple of pieces of raffia from that big lion <laughs> that's on the wall. and He didn't mind. I, I stole him from a part of his mane that you really can't see anyway. And I'm using those as grass. They're going to go between those two paper mache rocks and I painted the raffia with the same green that I used on the base. I made tiny white spots for reflection in his eyes and I did that by finding a tool that has a really really sharp point and I dipped it into some white acrylic paint and then just barely touched that point onto the black spots on his eyes. I painted the rocks very light gray and I tried to get as much uh, variation in there as I could so they'd be rock-like. I decided this shirt was just really too light so I added a little bit more ultramarine blue but just in some areas that, to make it a little bit more interesting. I found a jar of orange paint on the shelf and I used that as the undercoat on the honey jar. I left the I left an area free of orange paint so that I could um, put a label on the jar and 
right after I got it done, I realized I had misspelled honey. <laughs> we don't spell it the same way bears do, so I had to do it over. All of the honey jars in the book have those black lines on them, so I I went ahead and, and put those on with the felt tip pan, and then I had to paint over the misspelled <laughs> honey label, and I had to let that dry. And I made some off-white lines between those black lines, still letting a lot of the orange show, and I kind of dabbed it off. I wanted it to look, you know, like an old crockery jar. After the white paint on the label was dry, I <laughs> I wrote another label, is spelling it right this time. I put a coat of DuraClear satin varnish over both the bear and the honey jar, and I wanted to do that before everything was all put together, just to make sure that everything was sealed up really nice. This is a brand of varnish that I really like. Uh, it, it never turns cloudy, it doesn't change colors. Um, it, it's definitely my favorite, although I don't usually use the satin. I usually use a, a mat over my more realistic animals, but I thought it was perfect for this particular project. I checked one more time to make sure that that honey jar was going to actually <laughs> fit between his arms and legs, and it does. And then I really wanted it to look like it had honey kind of dripping out. So I used some foil to kind of fill it up and make uh, a base for the honey, just at the right angle that it would be sitting at when the jar was held at an angle. I put some hot glue at the bottom of the jar so that I could get the foil to stay in there. And then I did something really weird. It was the only thing I could <laughs> think of to do to get my, you know, something that really looked like it was dripping and had the right surface. I, <laughs> I put hot glue over the entire piece of aluminum foil, all the way around to the edges, completely covered it, and then I let it drip over that edge. It covered the aluminum foil, that little tongue that I had of foil sticking out, and let it drip out just a little bit more. And I liked the way it looked, and it was still really hot. <laughs> but it did level out because there was so much of it, you know, sitting right next to each other. It, it was melted together and it came really smooth and actually worked really well. Really was kind of in a hurry to get this whole project done, so I went and stuck it in the freezer to get it really nice and cool so that I could paint it. And while it was in the freezer, I went ahead and started uh, getting the grass ready to be put in between those rocks. I didn't want any of the grass pieces like coming out, so I put some wood glue all along the bottoms, made sure that every single piece was attached to every other piece, and then I just let it dry. Then I got the jar back out of the freezer and painted the honey with a mixture of yellow and white acrylic paint. It didn't really stick very well. <laughs> and I know that a lot of people do use hot glue in their projects, like on the on the surface of the projects for um, you know sculptural effects. And I know they paint them. I should have looked up on YouTube to see how they do that. But actually, the fact that the glue didn't stick, it made it kind of separate in really interesting patterns. And I actually really like it. But I wasn't sure it was going to actually stick. Uh, you know, maybe it would be really easy to scratch off or something. And so after the paint was dry, I did cover it with several coats of fingernail polish. I made sure that my pieces of grass would actually fit in between those rocks, and they did. <laughs> and so I used the hot glue, just um, put a whole bunch of it in between the rocks, and then pressed the bottoms of the grass down into it. I had to kind of move them around a little bit so that they would look the way I wanted to, right next to the bear, and they're, they're holding really well. I did test it later, kind of pulled on each one, <laughs> and, and they are staying where they belong. When the paint and the fingernail polish on the honey was dry, I put the jar back in there where, where it's going to go, just to see where it's going to hit the arms and, and the feet. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I got the hot glue in the right place. And then I just put a little bit of dab in, in those few spots. It's not going to be actually touching the bear in very many places, which makes me a little bit nervous, but it does seem to be holding pretty well.
And then I gave him one more coat of the satin DuraClear varnish, and he was done. Okay, it's all dry now. That varnish dries really fast. And the really nice thing about it is that even if you kind of pool it in certain areas, it doesn't end up being kind of white and milky like a lot of uh, acrylic varnishes do. It just dries clear no matter how badly you apply it. <laughs> So that's it for today. If you make one of these, um, like I said, it's going to go a lot faster for you than it did for me because I just didn't plan it out very well. And it is actually a really easy project. Making a, a little bear like this, there's almost no real details. There's no, no paws. It's a stuffed bear. So he doesn't have claws. He doesn't have a mouth, <laughs> you know. So it's a, a really simple project. And I just think it's going to be really nice sitting on a little girl's shelf, don't you think? Of course, I'll buy another uh, copy of that book and send that with it. So that's all I have for today. If you make one of these, please come back to the Daily Sculptures page on my site and show it off. I would really love to see how yours turns out. Um, and, and remember, you don't have to give him honey. Um, there's a lot of different illustrations in the book. Um, one of them is really cool. He's got a balloon. That would be really nice. Big blue balloon. I think that'd be really fun. Now go make something and come back and visit me. UltimatePaperMache.com. I'll see you there.